Okay. Guys, if you're coming in, just try and grab a seat. Okay, can everyone hear me there? Okay. Welcome to hours four and five of CASD this week. Uh, it won't be like this every week, um, so. Yeah, sorry for overloading you with a lot of information. Um, but yeah, hopefully things will be a little bit smooth through the rest of the semester in this unit. And sorry it's four and five o'clock on a Friday. Um, but yeah, as you know, you've got a lot of things on this semester. So uh, hopefully we'll get good attendance through the rest of the semester in this session because it's going to be the lectures only running for the first few weeks. But it's where you're really going to get a lot of the information that you're going to be able to use for the rest of the semester. Okay, uh, today I'm going to run through the uh, design brief again, okay, because we had to rush through it a little bit at the end of the last session. Um, a few items on kind of how we do conceptual design, uh, the architecture of a space mission, and then probably the most uh, kind of important thing for this, we're going to go through the group allocation. Okay, and what I'm going to do is actually get you guys to come up in hopefully the groups that you formed. Uh, so hopefully groups of nine people and enter that into a spreadsheet, and then I will do the allocation on Blackboard later. So I'll be here like, actually managing and troubleshooting that. And for anyone who isn't quite in a group of nine yet, that's fine because hopefully enough of you are here in the room so that if there are any groups that need to be formed right now, then you can actually talk to each other. Yep. Yes. So as I just said, so as I just said, I'm going to be doing it here in person on a spreadsheet on the screen. Okay, and then I will allocate you into the groups later on Blackboard. Yep. So the group allocation, I want to get as much of it done today. And if there's anyone who hasn't been attending here, then they will be placed in groups afterwards. Okay, but I'll do that over the weekend and you'll be put into your groups so that you can see them starting next week before the mental meetings. So the uh, role allocation will come after that. So the actual role selection within your groups. So who's going to be systems engineer, who's going to be mechanical engineer, that can happen over the next week, week and a half. Allocation of the groups. Most of it will happen today, and then kind of a deadline by uh, Monday night. Monday, Monday evening, afternoon evening. PM. Monday PM. OK? OK, any more? Questions before I make a start? Nope? Okay. Right. Uh, so just as a little bit of an overview here, we're going to go through what kind of comprises a space mission and the architecture of that space mission. Okay, so we've got a little image in the middle here of a guy putting together a puzzle. And you might have the subject or the thing that you're interested in looking at or doing some with, something with. Okay? So that is going to be your subject. Uh, that could be passive. Okay? So you could think about that as the, um, the natural environment and you're kind of imaging it. Or you could be doing something active. So you could be communicating with something directly that then is going to communicate back to you. Okay? So we can split that out into two different kind of sections there. You could define that in different ways. Okay? So this is not really that fixed there. You might have an orbital element to this. Uh, sometimes we call this the space segment. Okay? You might see that in quite a lot of the literature. Um, and that could include just a single orbit for a single spacecraft, or you could be designing a constellation. So then you have to think about how multiple orbits are going to work together. They could be the same orbit, just replicated, maybe changing 
uh, phasing of a constellation, maybe just changing the orientation of an orbit. Or you could have different orbits. So you could have a constellation where you have geostationary spacecraft and LEO spacecraft working together. Okay? That's still a constellation. We would just call that a heterogeneous constellation, not a homogeneous constellation. Uh, then you have your actual space system, the space element. Uh, you could have a single spacecraft, okay, so a monolithic spacecraft, one that's operating by itself, or you could have a distributed set of spacecraft. Okay? That might feed in to your orbit element, so there's going to be some kind of interaction there. But that distributed space segment could be all in the same orbit, like a swarm or a formation. It doesn't necessarily have to be in different orbits acting like a traditional constellation. Okay? So there are lots of different formats that this could take. Uh, you'll have your launch element. Uh, so you could have ground-based launch. You could have a ground launcher that takes you up to the International Space Station. And then you could be ejected from the space station into your orbit, okay? So that could be a space-based launch. You could be uh, ejected by some other type of deployer from the rocket body that took up a uh, primary payload, okay? So there's, again, complexity in the different types of uh, launch segment that you have there. Uh, you'll have your ground element, so how are you going to communicate with your spacecraft? From the ground, is that by a fixed uh, system? Is that going to be mobile? Is it an individual person with a handset? Unlikely at the moment, but direct to handset communications are coming in, so there's no reason why that couldn't also be part of your operational ground segment one day. Uh, you might also, in this ground segment, have relays to other spacecraft. Okay? So uh, there, there are a lot of common satellites up in uh, geo orbits. You could relay your ground segment through those so that you can connect or communicate with your spacecraft when it's not directly overhead. Okay, so that could be a more complicated ground segment. Uh, you also need to consider your operations. So whether that is uh, kind of purely monitoring the satellite on a day-to-day -day basis, just checking it's healthy, just checking that it's doing what it's supposed to be doing on an automatic basis, or actually uploading specific commands, uh, control elements, maybe thinking about software updates, um, if you need to do those as well. And then finally, uh, if your satellite is going to be communicating more widely, or is it just communicating back to a single ground station? Okay? So if you think about um, uh, things like uh, deep space probes, interstellar, uh, well, uh, kind of out into the solar system probes, they tend to be point to point. Okay? They only send data back to a single ground station or maybe a very small set of ground stations, usually the deep space network. But then other uh, satellites might have broadcast capabilities where, for example, a communications um, satellite is sending lots of data to lots of people in different places. And nowadays, a lot of the constellations are actually doing their operations through distributed ground station networks. So uh, you have things like um, KSAT or LeaseSpace that operate maybe 20, 30 different ground stations around the globe, and they can communicate with the spacecraft sending up those telemetry command and control elements. So these are all of the different things that you might have to think about in the context of your overall space mission. If we then want to kind of zoom in onto just that space segment, or the satellite, or your spacecraft, we can break this down in a different way. Okay, so now this is taking a much more kind of systems focused view on just the space segment. And you could consider that one of the key elements of this is going to be the payload, okay? This is really defining what that satellite or spacecraft is going to do and how it's going to do it, right? Uh, most spacecraft have a payload of some type. Some might have multiple, some might have many. You could say the International Space Station has many, many different types of payload on board. There aren't many spacecraft where you would consider it to have no payload at all, okay? because then it doesn't really have a purpose. The rest of the spacecraft, all of the supporting functions, we tend to consider either as the platform or the bus. Okay? And then underneath that, 
we can define a bunch of subsystems that then contribute to what that bus or platform is doing. So, of course, we need a structure, we need some way of powering it, we need some way of communicating back to the ground and communications within the spacecraft system itself. Uh, we might need some thermal control system, attitude determination and control. So all of these things that you would have touched on in space systems last year are going to be components of this spacecraft bus. Yep. If you, pardon? if you, so the communications could be a payload, right? So if your satellite's purpose was, for example, to beam TV, so uh, you have a, a ground link that sends a signal up and then it's essentially a vent pipe communication system back down to the ground, then yes, your payload would be a communication system. But then on the platform itself, you would have communications between the different subsystems and you would have command and control communications back to your ground station, okay? So in that sense, the um, communications, there would be a primary payload communications, and then there would be your like, system uh, communications as well, which is allowing your payload to do its job. Okay, does that make sense? Okay, uh, equally, you could have a docking camera, which is an optical system that is part of the bus so that it can actually attach to something, but then you might have a observation camera which would be the primary payload, okay? And you can have primary and secondary payloads as well, so it's not necessarily just one payload like I've shown here, and maybe they have a priority or maybe they're an equal priority, okay? Uh, onboard data handling as well. And this is not exhaustive, right? So there are many different subsystems that are gonna be uh, on a typical spacecraft, okay? depending on the mission that it's got to do. Okay, and then I wanted to also introduce this idea of the space mission life cycle. Okay, so uh, right at the top here, we're gonna be focused on these three sections here. Okay, but as you'll find as we go through the rest of the semester, what you do in those first three kind of boxes, those first three segments, is going to be highly dependent on what your spacecraft needs to do later, okay? So we're gonna start with the concept. You're gonna come up with some ideas of how your spacecraft is going to achieve the user needs or to solve the problem statement uh, that we've given you, or we'll, I'll be talking through in a, in a moment as well. You're gonna uh, perform some feasibility studies and then we're gonna to start to work on a little bit of preliminary design, okay? We're not necessarily going to get all the way to where we would consider preliminary design to end, which with, is with a review, a PDR, preliminary design review, but we should get some way along that process by the end of this semester, okay? After that, you would have a much, much bigger design study where you really drill into all of that detail that then kind of fleshes out that system, allows you to move into manufacturing, assembly, integration, qualification, testing, all of those elements. Finally, hopefully your spacecraft is built, tested, you can launch it, it will be on orbit, you can do some commissioning activities, which basically means that you're gonna check out all of the systems, make sure that they work properly, and then you can move on to your main operations, okay? the period of time where the mission is actually doing what it was intended to do is kind of primary purpose. That's not where it ends. So then we have the end of life, and that's something that you need to think about in that early design phase. Okay, what do you do with your spacecraft at the end of life? Too many missions have already been launched where end of life was not adequately thought about. Okay, and now this is where we have issues with debris. Okay. This is a lot of the inspiration for your design brief, okay? Um, and I'll come on to that as well. And then even after the end of life, okay, that's not where a project, and hopefully you'll do some of this in, in ops management and things like that. A project doesn't just end and everyone forgets about it. Hopefully you go through a phase of actually learning about that, uh, the whole project, 
what went well, what didn't go so well, and what changes you can make to influence the next iteration, okay? And then you can take those ideas into the next system concept development, okay? And that should inform all of the different elements. Okay. I briefly showed this uh, earlier in the week, uh, but I'm gonna spend a little bit more time going through it now because these are the individual roles in your teams that I want you to take, okay? And I split it up, it's not in, uh, if you've talked to any of your colleagues in uh, years ahead, this is not the same uh, hierarchy that I've used before, okay? In this case, we now have verticals and horizontals. Uh, I've dispensed with the chief engineer kind of role, and now we have a systems engineer or a lead systems engineer who is responsible across, but we also have an operations engineer and a sustainability and manufacturing engineer that will also span across all of the other subsystem disciplines, okay? So I hope you can see how the previous slide where we have this life cycle where operations is going to influence your design, okay? If you haven't thought about how your spacecraft is really gonna work in the orbital environment, the order in which things have to happen. Um, and if any of you were here for the uh, ingenuity lecture uh, last night, um, the speaker actually say, uh, had a slide on concept of operation speaking about how they had to interface with the uh, Mars rover perseverance so that the ingenuity helicopter could actually do its operations. That fed into the design, okay? How is the communication system developed so that you can actually do that on a day-to-day -day basis? And from a manufacturing and sustainability aspect, if you don't think in your design phase about how you're going to build something, and you don't think in your design phase about how you're going to dispose of something, then suddenly you'll get to these elements of the life cycle, and it, yeah, you won't have any ability to affect it anymore, especially with the space system where you can't intervene with it so easily you then have to design another mission to go and retrieve it or to do something, okay? So we really wanna embed these ideas early in the design cycle and make sure that we've accounted for them, okay? So that's why these roles span across all of these other uh, disciplines which are a little bit more system focused or subsystem focused. Sir? Yep. Can somebody help with, um, can somebody help with integrating two systems together like with guidance, navigation, So, someone doesn't need to do that, but multiple people will, right? So your uh, propulsion engineer and your GNC engineer will principally work together to solve that problem. And that will be facilitated and integrated together by the systems engineer, who will kind of manage that communication and make sure that those elements are integrated correctly with all of the other elements of the system as well. Okay, so it's not just that the propulsion engineer would need to talk to the GNC engineer, but also potentially about how that communication needs to take place, because if you've got orientation of your vehicle, you might not be pointing your antennas in the right direction. Okay, that might also consume a lot of power. So if you're trying to do two operations at once, then you'll need to speak with the power engineer as well. Okay? And whilst that's all happening, if you're thinking about operating a propulsion system and an attitude control system, then that is all feeding into the operations plan. Okay? The operations engineer needs to know that these things need, are going to happen at the same time so that they can produce a, a kind of a schedule for it, plan the operations, make sure that there aren't too many demands on the system all at the same time. Okay? So you can see how all of these things are linked together. Okay. And normally in your groups, as long as they work out to nine people, then each person will take on one of these roles during the semester. And uh, in slightly smaller groups, 
then we'll split out some of the individual responsibilities below these as necessary. Okay? Not all of these tasks are necessarily equal as well. So depending on your concept, depending on uh, which scenario you choose, then um, there might be some balancing work between all of the different members of the team over the semester. Okay? And in your group mentor uh, sessions, we can talk through that. Okay? So um, how you manage those um, kind of changes in workload between the different members of the group over the semester is going to be important, and we'll help you with that as well. Uh, and any questions about these kind of group role elements at the moment that doesn't seem kind of clear at the moment? Yep. Ah, okay, so um, in this diagram, the different things in the vertical boxes are not split up across the horizontal boxes. Okay, so the system engineer, operations engineer, and sustainability engineer are interested in all of the things in the colored boxes. Okay, they're not necessarily split up in different sections. So ops engineer is definitely interested in the control that the GNC engineer is going to be uh, looking at designing. Okay, and similarly, um, let's have a look. Uh, manufacturing engineer is definitely going to be interested in the structure and the power system. Okay, so... Is it solar arrays, or is it some type of fuel cell, or are you going to put a nuclear engine on your spacecraft, and how is that going to be accommodated into the structure? They are all elements that will need to be uh, accounted for when you're thinking about the manufacturing of the system, and then also how sustainable that system is. Okay? Cool. Um, this is also just a kind of brief overview in the uh, design brief document. There is a much, much more... Uh, kind of extensive list of the responsibilities and kind of tasks that each person might be involved in that's involved with each role. So uh, when you're thinking about this in your groups, about who's interested in what elements, have a look at that list. But again, it's non-exhaustive, okay? So that we haven't accounted for every single thing that you could think about or you could do. Uh, you also need to go away and look at the, the different things that are involved with those subsystems and what people in industry might typically do as well. Okay. Sorry. Yes? Uh, are the systems engineer, operations engineer, sustainability manufacturing engineer expected to design things, or are they supposed to combine designs together? As in, are they the ones that create things? Or... That's a really good question. Okay. Um, so, not next week, but the week after, I'm going to talk about, in one of the lectures, systems modeling. Okay. So in each of these roles, and that goes for the systems engineer, the ops engineer, and the sustainability engineer, I will be expecting to see some element of systems modeling. Okay? So they design and manage at the same time? Yes. Yep. So they, these are not management roles. Okay? They are engineering roles. Okay? The systems engineer is going to be nominally responsible for that integrated systems model. So how does the mission and the mechanical engineer and electrical engineer, how do they combine their outputs to really create a synthesized satellite solution? Okay? How do those um, outputs from each of those subsystem modeling exercises come together so that you can produce an overall mass for the spacecraft? Um, an overall power budget for the spacecraft. How, do, how is all of the data going to be transferred between the different subsystems? All of those elements you need to think about in an integrated systems model. Okay? That's the systems engineer. The operations engineer will also be creating systems models, but they're slightly different in a lot of cases in the form of a concept of operations. But also you can think about it, and I'll go into this in the ops lecture, which is next week, how do things like the power raising performance or the power demand on the satellite change in the different modes of operation? So in the commissioning phase, you might not have unfolded your solar arrays yet. Okay? Maybe they, they need to be unfolded. What capability does your spacecraft have in that phase compared to the normal mission phase? The electrical engineer normally will have size the solar arrays for the peak power condition. 
but you need to make sure that your spacecraft can operate reliably and safely in lots of other conditions. So there could be safe modes, there could be an end of life mode, there could be a orbit raising mode, lots of different things, okay? So they'll be interfacing in the system's modeling exercise that the operations engineer will need to think about, okay? And then in the uh, sustainability and manufacturing side, there's gonna be things like life cycle analysis that you need to think about. So what are the overall costs in terms of uh, maybe carbon budget or in terms of financial sustainability as well that are associated with all of these different elements, okay? So there's gonna be modeling there to do with that as well. And again, what we'd ideally like to see is across the full life cycle of the mission and not just for the system or a kind of space segment. So uh, if you can, can you model how much the design effort for this spacecraft might cost based on a certain uh, methodology? Uh, how much are the operations gonna cost because you have one ground segment or if you have a concept where you're gonna use 10 ground segments, ground stations, okay? So you can do modeling based on that, yep. Yep, so I mean, it, what I was intending with that was just to have a, a mentality that you're looking for a way of trying to sell your um, system when it comes to the trade show and in developing and proving the feasibility of your system rather than acting like a much, much bigger company where you may be trying to um, convince an internal customer that your project should go forward, okay? So uh, in that sense, don't necessarily think that your budget uh, or how you should act is constrained by being a small startup. Uh, I mean, here you're given nine people. Most startups probably don't start with nine people. Um, but yeah, just, just think about the fact that towards the end of the semester when you're in the trade show, it's about showing your design off externally as if you were trying to convince someone that this is a really, really good idea to take forward, that they might want to uh, invest in it, okay? But remember, it's not a pitch, it's engineering communication, okay? And there'll be some more guidance on the trade show as we go through the semester as well. Okay, uh, let's go through the problem again briefly. Um, I've already heard from you, uh, some of you that you're quite, uh, we well, found this quite interesting. So to develop a satellite that can perform imaging of other orbiting objects to support space domain awareness activities. Space domain awareness is something you might wanna look up. Uh, there are also other terms that are used in this. So space uh, situational awareness um, is another term that's very, very closely related to this. Um, debris classification and on orbit asset monitoring. Okay, so that's just a brief problem statement. Uh, we can dig into this a little bit more. So the, the kind of inspiration or background to this is obviously the amount of debris that is currently in orbit, presenting a problem potentially to long-term use of the space environment, but also presently presenting an issue to spacecraft operations because we don't know where a lot of the small-scale stuff is, but we also don't know enough about a lot of the big stuff that's out there. We have an idea of where it might have come from and its orbit, but we don't know if we wanted to go and collect it, exactly what shape, what size it might be, its actual um, orientation or whether it's tumbling, its attitude, as we call it. And if we wanted to go and actually interface with it, what points might be appropriate for grabbing onto or attaching some other subsystem to so that we can deorbit it, okay? So there are many different elements of this problem that we could try and address. So we could look at just identifying and tracking this small scale debris, the stuff that we can't really track from the ground very easily. We could classify and catalog 
the debris that we do know about and that small scale debris in more, um, with more information. And then we could look at maybe assessment of damage or deterioration to spacecraft that we know exactly what they're, where they are, but maybe they've had a malfunction and they're not operating correctly, or maybe they're defunct, but we just want to know what we can do about them so that we can remove them from orbit safely. Okay. And then our proposed solution to this is then to look at actually tracking and imaging spacecraft using orbital assets. Okay. This isn't necessarily the only solution to the problem of tracking debris. But in this conceptual design brief, this is the type of system that we want you to develop. Okay? Uh, there have been a couple of examples of this, and I would really urge you to look some of these up. Okay, so the green background picture uh, was taken in 1994. Okay? So quite a long time ago, but you can see that actually there's not much detail in that image. If you actually look at the original image, this is actually a heavily corrected one. The satellite was all really, really squashed up. And that's because it was moving relatively very fast compared to the spacecraft that it was, the, the image was taken by. Okay? So the relative velocity of the two spacecraft was very, very large. Uh, you'll see the one down here. Um, this one's much, much more recent, so I think 2021. Uh, and you can see that there's a lot more detail here. If there was a big hole in the solar panel or half of it was missing, you could probably see that information. Uh, if you had CAD files for this spacecraft, you could probably do a pretty detailed comparison to figure out what might have gone wrong. And if you've got subsequent pictures, okay, so maybe you were able to take two, three, four, five different frames, you could probably infer some information about how that spacecraft was rotating with respect to either the Earth or the spacecraft that it was uh, taken by or with respect to some other reference frame. Okay? That tells you something about its orientation over time. So if you were to try and rendezvous with the spacecraft, you would have some information to start with. Okay? In terms of a debris removal mission, having that information might be really critical for a feasibility study whether you should even try and go and get that spacecraft or not. Okay? If it's rotating too fast, probably too difficult. If it's got a, um, a relatively uh, kind of slower speed of rotation that you could match, you could do something with, then yeah, you might choose to pick that one to go ahead and actually do your debris removal mission on. Uh, there are other challenges. I think you can see from the both pictures, lighting conditions are going to be quite challenging to maintain, especially in orbit. You've got lighting from the Earth. You've got lighting from the sun. If you're in eclipse, you might not be able to see much. But you could also think about using different parts of the spectrum as well. So you could potentially use infrared. You could use active um, sensing methods if you want to. So it doesn't necessarily have to be optical imaging that you want to perform. You could use uh, LIDAR, radar, infrared those kind of things as well, okay? And then you also need to critically think about how many pieces of debris you want to be able to track, image, and catalog, how often you want to be able to do that, and where you want to do that imaging, okay? So your orbits are, unless you have a propulsion system on board, going to be relatively fixed. The debris, unless they're active, are going to be pretty fixed in their orbit that they're in currently. Unless it's under the perturbation of, of drag, maybe it's reducing. Maybe there's some solar radiation pressure effects, those kind of things as well. But you will have to think about how your spacecraft is going to image things in different orbits if you're doing a general surveying mission compared to actually getting up close to a single spacecraft if you really want to image it in detail, which might be more relevant maybe in a geo-orbit, for example, where you can get really, really close to something and, and do some very, very detailed imaging. So you'll have to think about what those constraints are in terms of how you manage a propellant budget, 
and how you manage maybe if you have multiple spacecraft being able to survey different orbits at different times. Did I miss one? Nope. Okay. So down to the uh, actual main task. So you're going to be working in groups of nine students, as I mentioned, and you want to take advantage of this opportunity to deliver these really interesting and new data products. Okay? There isn't anything out there that is really delivering this as a, a kind of an openly available commercial product. There are some missions out there that do it from a defense or military perspective. Okay? And the main kind of goal within the semester is to produce a credible, conceptual design. Okay? We don't need to go all the way to the end of the preliminary design phase. Far too much work for you to do in a single semester. And the idea is that with that conceptual design, you can prove to us through your written report and in the trade show that, yeah, you've got a really, really good idea and it's likely to be successful. And if we had the funds, we would say, yeah, go ahead, deliver it. Okay? Go on to do that more uh, preliminary design into the detailed design and then go ahead, build it, launch it. Okay. And I've said here the system shall be designed to perform on-orbit observation. This is really just constraining down the problem a little bit so that you're not just thinking loads and loads of ideas out there, okay? So, um, providing all of these different products. And I brought this up briefly um, on Tuesday, I think it was. Three different scenarios. We'd like you to do one of these, but if you think that you can design a system to do more than one of these at the same time, or maybe you want to split up the operations and start with one of these and then move on to one of the other ones, go ahead. But I think it will be quite challenging. Okay? So we've kind of split these out into three, uh, these three different scenarios. So the first one is going to be um, looking at geo or GSO satellites in really high detail. Okay, so if you wanted to remove that spacecraft from orbit, providing all of the information that a potential debris removal company would need to say, yes, that is a spacecraft that we're going to remove, and this is exactly how we're going to do it, and this is why we have confidence that we're going to be successful in removing it. Okay? So uh, thinking really about kind of high-resolution imagery, so you're probably going to need to be relatively close to it unless you have a very big telescope, knowledge about um, the attitude of the spacecraft over time, maybe knowledge about any uh, changes or, or um, kind of damage that's been, um, that's impacted on the spacecraft because that might change how you would approach it, okay? Actually relying on the design of something and then realizing in orbit that it, the bit that you wanted to grab isn't there anymore, that would be essentially a mission failure, right? If you were trying to go and get that piece of debris. Okay. The second scenario is then uh, kind of closer to the Earth, LEO-based. Okay. We kind of missed out uh, MEO, which is where a lot of the GPS satellites are, because it's not that congested compared to LEO. Okay. Um, you could consider MEO if you want to, but suggest that LEO is uh, maybe more interesting for some of these, um, for the, some of these large satellites. Um, and to go and actually, yeah, get some more information on their actual status. Um, we can image these from the ground, or we can get quite a lot of image from the, uh, information from the ground, but then actually providing things like damage assessment and attitude data for those as well. And there are specific challenges for LEO compared to GEO that you'll have to look into. Okay? This is why I suggested that you might not be able to design the spa same spacecraft working in GEO and LEO. Okay. And then the final scenario is looking at that really, really small debris, the stuff that we just can't track from the ground. Okay, we have really, really big ground-based radars that are constantly kind of pinging electromagnetic radiation off any object in space. But these objects are too small to be able to be resolved against all of the background noise. So we can't do that from the ground. But from space, when you're much, much closer to these things, you will be able to detect them, okay? And 
that's the, the third scenario there. Okay. Uh, when I've said here relevance to high value orbits, um, when you look at the uh, distribution of debris in space, and when you look at where all of the past missions have been placed, you will notice, and I think from space systems you should have some appreciation of, where a lot of the spacecraft are and why they're there. Okay, so sun synchronous orbits are a really good example of that. I mean, GEO is a different uh, example of that, but in LEO, sun synchronous orbits, because of their advantages in terms of lighting conditions, for example. So if you were to choose maybe the most at-risk orbit and the one where your system could provide the highest value, sun synchronous orbit might be the one to choose. But you guys might look at the data and see something else that might be also relevant. Uh, we've also added a few constraints here. So uh, we want you to design a single satellite and mission, but you may want to consider how this might scale, particularly if you're looking in LEO, because obviously you have constraints about what orbits are visible and what might be visible from your orbit. Okay? But also if you're in GEO and you want to inspect three, four, five different things that are all in different parts of the GEO belt, you might just think about replicating your mission. How might that feed into your manufacturing if you're building one spacecraft compared to 10? Okay. But we don't necessarily want you to get too bogged down into designing constellations or uh, multi-satellite systems. Okay. Might get a little bit complex for what you need to do in a single semester. Um, we want you to use launch vehicles or launch opportunities and spacecraft technologies which are going to be realized relatively soon. Okay, so we're not constraining you to only things that are available now, but things that you have some confidence, and you can base this on things like technology readiness level, or whether they have been launched with some heritage, or whether they are about to be launched for some te technology demonstration. But not, yeah, fanciful ideas on technology that is either really, really conceptual, has barely been demonstrated, or is just straight out of science fiction, okay? So you need to be able to demonstrate that as well in your work, okay? Justifying why you have chosen a particular uh, component or technology based on, uh, yeah, its maturity. And also, going back to that life cycle element, we want you to consider all of these phases of the mission in your conceptual design. Okay, so making sure that you're thinking about, for example, end of life in your design. Okay? Can't just forget about that. Of course, mission operations is going to be a pretty important one. If you don't think about that, then why are you designing a mission in the first place? Uh, making sure you capture things about early operations, so commissioning phases, if you're uh, being deployed from some other uh, method and you're not the primary um, satellite on a launch vehicle, how does that affect your design, your early, uh, the early parts of your mission? And of course, that launch phase as well. Okay? What, is, what are the differences in environment that you might experience on a launch vehicle compared to actually being in space where your satellite is going to be primarily designed for? Okay. So this is going to be the majority of the rest of this time. Uh, once you are sorted with your group, and I'll bring up a spreadsheet in a moment, then you can either hang around here and chat, maybe discuss about your roles within the group, or if you want to, you can disappear. Uh, but what I want you to do, if you haven't already done it, is try and form these groups of nine. If you just want to be paired up with anyone, it's fine by me. I will allocate you into a group later. So this is what I'm calling the open pool. And yep, as I said, I will, I will make this work as necessary. So then after today and through to your mentor meeting next week, I want you to discuss what roles you're going to uh, have within your group. 
discuss that with your mentor, and then actually record that role in Blackboard later. Okay, but that doesn't, the recording of your roles doesn't need to be done until week three. Okay. Guys, if you just 